Welcome to Subject to Power. I'm El Kamihira. Our language tells us a lot about who we are and how we became that way. It holds hidden truths about our cultural heritage, our current reality, and who controls it. And etymology, the study of the origins of words, can unlock this knowledge. My guest today, Jane Caputi, has spent her career unearthing the history and meaning of words, our language, and cultural beliefs, especially as it pertains to sex, violence, and the destruction of our natural environment. In this episode, I talked to Jane about her latest book, which is A Sweeping Interpretation of Our Current Era, The Anthropocene, or The Age of Man. And she walks me through the origins of the term motherfucker. She explains why Mother Earth is not a metaphor and breaks down the difference between omnipotence and concupiscence. And I hope I'm saying that right. You've written quite a few books, but I wanted to focus on your latest book called Call Your Mother. A Deliberately Dirty-Minded Manifesto for the Earth Mother in the Anthropocene. Yes. <laughs> Which I really, really love. There's so, oh, good. there's so much in it. It's so like sweeping and kind of dizzying to read because you go back and forth in time and between really big concepts. And so I wanted to start with talking about shifting epistemology. And epistemology is like a, a big word for who the knower is, mm -hmm. like who, who gets to impart the knowledge. Can you talk a little bit about what you wanted to do with the book in that regard? Yeah, epistemology is one of those big words, but it is like who gets to be the knower and how do we know what we know if we know? And certainly, you know, those of us who have studied patriarchy or heteropatriarchy or all white supremacists, you know, <laughs> all of those things that we know are packed into this kind of domination system now, has also controlled how we know what we know. It controls and defines. Gerda Lerner wants to find patriarchy. It's not only the domination of men, but how this elite group gets to define reality. So what we know has everything to do with what we understand to be reality. And when you look at alternative epistemologies, which I absolutely consulted and tried to practice in writing this book, for example, the great thinker and scientist Robin Wall Kimmerer, who draws upon her Potawatomi heritage to say that you have to know something with all four aspects of your being, and I hope I'm going to get them right, but your mind, your spirit, your emotions, and your body. Like, it's not just the thinker, which is conceptualized as a sort of abstract masculinity and a brain just thinking and thinking, and that's supposedly knowledge. That isn't. That is domination. It's including the idea of the mind dominating matter or the body, which has always represented women, nature, anything associated with the feminine. So we do have to recognize not only that we as human beings have to know differently through all those facets of our being, but that we're not the only knowers. <laughs> That's right. That the earth is generating knowledge, that other beings generate knowledge, have cultural and symbol systems, communication. So part of the alternative epistemology that I really activate in Call Your Mother is dreaming. I gain a lot of knowledge from my dreams. And that, again, other cultures have recognized that you go to school in your dreams in some ways, that this opens you to communication with other than human beings, including with what we think of as the earth or nature. Beverly Smith once said to me, that's the universe shouting at you. Like you pay attention. These are really important ones. And I tell some of those throughout the book. And I believe that they brought me a certain kind of knowledge that I wouldn't have been able to access any other way. Of course, we're so divided, I think, in kind of mind, soul, or mind, body at the moment. It brings to mind just something Evan Stark, the sociologist, he came up with the concept of coercive control in um, domestic violence right. relationships. And he uses a word called prospecticide, which is really like killing someone's point of view and replacing mm. it with your own. Really. And it's so clearly allied. Like that is the basic eco feminist idea is that these kinds of characteristic dominations and abuses of male supremacy have really characterized also the ways that dominators define and treat nature or the earth. 
And so the perspective aside of an abuser is to like obliterate the reality of the victim through isolation, through gaslighting, all that, right? But the same thing has happened, like the earth is said to be dumb and not speak. That perspective aside is about the control of reality. But part of undoing those is really changing what we understand as reality. That is like core to the struggle. Another thing you talk about too is that when we talk about mother nature or mother earth, we are taught to kind of perceive that as a quaint metaphor, but it's not. And you you right. really talk directly about that, that all of this language and how we talk about it is not a metaphor. No, it's not a metaphor. <laughs> and again, I am indebted to indigenous thinkers who really made that point to me, but also Vandana Shiva would say that, you know, coming from, she's um, a native of India, that in many other knowledge traditions, yeah, Mother Earth is not a metaphor. And it's not some as Linda Tuha, we Smith, the decolonial Maori thinker says, it's not a misty-eyed romantic notion of like, loving mother, you're at the bosom, she'll clean up after you. It's really understood as an earth being or an earth parent, and it's a scientific principle. This is reality. We are completely dependent on the earth, as dependent as a fetus in the womb. That's a scientific idea that if everyone would recognize, including those running and ruining the planet right now, they would realize is the ultimate act of mass murder suicide to destroy the life, what we call mother nature. It's a kind of matricide, but also a kind of suicide at the same time. So it's a scientific principle as well as a spiritual principle, as well as an emotional principle, because we do need to be devoted to the source and the force that allows us being. So no, not a metaphor, not a <laughs> metaphor. It's very real. And there's many ways to understand it, including our dependency, including ideas of love, like as in that great Frida Kahlo painting where she sits on the lap of Mother Earth and Mother Earth is in the embrace of the universe. And that recognizing the Earth as Mother, you are part of that continuum of being. And, you know, the whole Western ideas of death as terrible termination that creates so much ego and desire for immortality and desire for control could shift. The idea of death as rebirth or as a continuation. Very sort of central to your book <laughs> is the term motherfucker. And I absolutely love this because it is it's just so all-encompassing. And you come at it in many different ways. Can you sort of break down how you think about the term in all the ways? Yes. Okay, first I'll say, of course, it's not my term. It really is a term that came out of the extraordinary genius of Black English, Black language in the United States. And, you know, I think it's a deep, I think it's a genius word, a deeply philosophical word with like infinite meanings. But so I'll sort of break it down and start at the beginning. Where the word comes from, according to folk etymology, the official linguists will not acknowledge this, but in folk etymology, and I'm getting this from Geneva Smitherman, and Sami Alim in their book, Articulate While Black. But the origin of it was, of course, during the period of enslavement in the United States, the white master and mistress owned people. They could do whatever they want to them. And the master raped Black women, not only for pleasure, domination, et cetera, but also as a capitalist stratagem by creating more slaves that, you know, they were really even counted as capital. It's just this extraordinary system of abuse. And so the folk etymology is that, you know, the master would enslave his own children born through enslaved mothers. So that, that he was not the father, he was the mother fucker. That's the folk etymology. And Dolores Williams, the eco-womanist theologian and thinker, said that the treatment of Black women's body during the period of enslavement is the paradigm for ecological destruction in which they were used not only to produce by laboring, but to reproduce. The tactic was breaking their spirits through rape and then forcing reproduction, turning what they both produced and reproduced into capital and then exhausting them. And this is exactly, she says, what's happening to the earth through strip mining or mountaintop removal, et cetera. So the word motherfucker leads us to understand 
the master in the sense, not only of like the white master during enslavement, but the master as the man in the Anthropocene. The Anthropocene is called the age of man in which supposedly men dominate nature. Is this conception of the master who can basically fuck the earth into submission, fucking as like not only sexual, but as like domination, as um, destruction, right? We have that in our language. The F word means both I supposedly have sex with you, but I completely obliterate you and do you in. I'm going to F you up. What does that mean? So it really speaks to the merger of sex and violence in a heteropatriarchal culture and that kind of domination that is sexualized as well as how sexuality is turned into domination. So I look at the Anthropocene as the basic mother fucking of Mother Earth and look at how you know the patterns and the forms that that takes as part of that sort of domineering strategy. But then I flip it. That's another concept from Black English is flipping the script, that you you flip something and you not only it's an epistemological move as well, you see it in a completely different way. Mary Daly also talked about this as reversal. You really understand that patriarchal culture sets up these reversals like Adam giving birth to Eve, things like that, or man dominating nature instead of the other way around. But if you flip the word motherfucker, you come up with the mother who fucks. And that's the earth mother, <laughs> the ultimate. She is really the one who is she. And I say she qualifiedly because this mother is totally outside of the gender binary. This mother is outside of patriarchal definition completely. And this mother is the one who, and it is a very sexual, generative, creative. It's the total fusion of what we understand as mind and body and emotion and spirit. Whereas fucking becomes like this kind of extraordinary creative generative force that is both, it's sexual and it is deeply intellectual at the same time. And that is the force that is generating being and creating life over and over and over. So that's the mother who fucks. And that's the ultimate mother. And like in Black English, the motherfucker changed, the script flipped. In Black English, motherfucker started as the vilest insult, naming the worst possible kind of human being, the white master. But around, you know, somewhere in the 20th century, it flipped. And you could see like when Janelle Monet came out as pansexual and queer, she said something like, I'm not quoting her exactly, I've had relationships with both women and men, and I am a free ass motherfucker. And like, wow, like think of like the meaning of the word there. It is somebody who is aligned with that genius of the life force that is able to create, able to survive, able to generate. You do go into talking about the Anthropocene and the destruction of the planet. And we often say, you know, humanity mm. is destroying the planet. But you make a different point, and I'd love to hear that. Of course. And, and again, I'm not the only one who makes this point either. It's just such a lie. The great decolonial thinker Sylvia Winter was one of the first and most influential in pointing this out, that the ruling class, you know, ruling white ethno class, you know, what we think of as Western man, has created the human as well as God in his image. And so when they talk about the human, they really mean themselves. And think of how they've defined, like Aristotle defined women as um impotent and mutilated men. Like we weren't really fully human. I mean, when the colonialists drive, like Native American and Africans were deemed savages. So the human has been really made in their image. So we first have to keep that in mind, that the word human has been used as a tool of oppression. Yeah. Why it's wrong to say that humans are causing this. Not only is it that small group, but it really completely uh, destroys our understanding that there are many humans who have not done nothing to cause the ecological damage, but who are suffering the worst effects. So it's diverting attention from who's actually doing the damage. So it's a lie. What else? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Another flip. Yeah. It's a reversal. Yes. Humans are yeah. causing this problem, which is not true. So they call themselves humans so trickily. Yeah, yeah. You have a quote in your book that says, they evade responsibility by masking structural inequities and their own culpability by referring to universal we of humans doing the damage. They predict miraculous technological fixes, and then they claim innocence because they didn't really mean it. David Grinspoon. And David Grinspoon is a scientist. He's a astrobiologist 
And he wrote a book, The Earth in Human Hands, as if really all humans are equally controlling the planet. And he says, we, whoever we is, we suddenly find ourselves sort of running a planet, a role we never anticipated or sought. We just obliviously stumbled into ecological and climate danger, he says, inadvertently messing with the earth. He says humans are really not criminals, but like an infant staring at its hands, wondering what he could do. He compares like the ones destroying the planet to awkward, naive and reckless adolescents who just want to see things blow up, you know, self-exculpatory as well as deceptive, as if the ones who are doing this destruction don't know exactly how they're profiting from it, haven't strategized it. But like taking this kind of boys will be boys, we're just sort of innocent and like an elite young man, the way his defense attorney would defend him in a rape trial. Oh, he didn't really mean it. He was just naive and adolescent and et cetera. So this is this is the level of discourse from really extremely educated people and scientists who who really know better bringing in this false notion of the human who are really controlling the earth. Yeah, and you you know what strikes me about that is that it's simultaneously all powerful and very arrogant and godly, but at the same time claiming complete innocence. Well, we know how really corrupt the concept innocence is in so many ways. Like who who gets associated with innocent and who is criminalized, who is automatically associated with doing bad things. And this group that has been I mean, you know, you sound like a conspiracy theorist saying they, but I do mean those running top militaries, governments, corporate capitalism, corporate socialism, basically those who create a social hierarchy and put themselves atop it. They have presented propaganda for forever of themselves as the clean, the innocent, the rational, the righteous, et cetera, and really criminalize everybody else. And they're adopting this mantle of innocence. And they they are taking that, all those stereotypes they've generated about themselves and using it here to justify or to excuse the damage they have done and that are continuing to do. Yeah. You mentioned it earlier, but I want to kind of circle back and dig into a little bit the concept of uh, nature as female, that it's regenerative. And then you also talk about how the Anthropocene or the age of man is a overwhelm, like it's an overwhelm. Right. Can you talk a little bit right. more about what you mean? Yeah, I was quoting, in that case, Paul Crutzen, uh, the atmosphere chemist, who was writing with several other historians and journalists about the Anthropocene. And they use the phrase, man overwhelms nature. And overwhelm, you know, has these concepts of like sexual overwhelming, a kind of a rape concept. Christina Sharp in her book, In the Wake, about the way that enslavement is really sedimented into American culture. Like what are all the repercussions that continue to this day from slavery? Talks about how whiteness or white supremacy became this overwhelming force. And there is this kind of totally, total domination, total control of another being that is sought, that is aggrandized, and that really does have that kind of sexual and enslavement component. Like so much goes back to that kind of ultimate possession of another, whether it is, and possession can mean to possess someone sexually or to possess someone bodily, really like literally own them. That is at the model of like the man behind the Anthropocene or the age of man. So, and nature as female, you know, nature is very fluid, flexible. That's part of being creative is that new forms are always being generated and created. Obviously, Female is usually seen as a biological designation, but as we all know, it's also a cultural consideration. And there's always this back and forth between what we understand as nature and culture. I used to love that t-shirt, the future is female, and like it has had so many definitions over the years. What I think we meant by it in the 70s was that, I think Mary Daly once said to me, if the future isn't female, there's not going to be any future at all. That like, it was a masculinism. And that kind of hyper heteropatriarchy that was in this quest for total overwhelming domination was really going to commit the ultimate mass murder suicide on the planet and everyone else. So that's what we meant by it back then. It's also come to mean other things. But 
I think that we have to really complicate that understanding of nature as female. Nature is also male. Otherwise, you wouldn't have what we see as maleness. Nature is also intersex. Nature is also gender fluidity. Nature is all these things and more that is even beyond our grasp. So this fecundity that really is found in our bodies, no matter how our bodies are labeled sexually. And I tend to fall into like really understanding what we see as male and female as much more analogous than as oppositional. You know, we're always told that, oh, the opposite sex, et cetera. But that sets up a warring opposition. Why have we gone into this total binary opposition as well as fantasizing and constructing the penis as phallus, as like weapon, as capable of doing injury, as being the agent of fucking in that really dominating sense and constructing the idea of the female as like this empty space to occupy and violate. Andrea Dworkin wrote about that in Intercourse. Sex is so much at the root of this. Our, our constructions and understandings of sex the enactments of sexuality in like these kind of destructive ways and the kind of erotophobia that causes this alienation from the body, from the dirt, from what we see of its nature, from the muck, right? Which is really, that's what Valerie Solanus meant by the scum manifesto, to get down to the basic scum, because that's the generative source of everything. And it's not easily categorized either. It would totally resist that categorization. You're smiling. <laughs> I, I, I love <laughs> like that. that. I love that. And it made me think about something in your book where you talk about the penis, that the phallus and the penis are really different things. The phallus is this, you know, like violent uh, sort of penetrative symbol that you talked about. But the penis, the actual physical thing, is not that at all. You talk about no. this. It, go ahead. Yeah. No, the phallus is this fantasy. It's a patriarchal fantasy of the penis as this, like, permanently hard, erect, like onto a weapon. There's a lot of history about the phallus and religious imagery, and it, it didn't always mean that kind of domination. It really was an image of fecundity, generative. But in patriarchal cultures, it becomes this sort of weapon-like symbol of potency and omnipotence, all power. Like God is basically a phallus right, in the patriarchal imagination. Above, dominating, hard, you know, unchanging, Trump towers, skyscrapers, you know, all these phallic symbols, nuclear weapons. But, you know, the penis is much more flower than tower. I mean, it's more often soft than hard, fragrant, beautiful, fertilizing, and really very analogous to the vulva. And of course, not all every vulva is alike, not every penis is alike. We're analogs, you know, we're really of each other and more than just two really, right? Once we get out of, again, that paradigm that, of opposition. So I think we should go in that direction. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. But instead, now we have this very deadly rivalry where the reigning patriarchy looks at mother nature as a rival. Yes, Yes, it was even, again, back to that article with Paul Crutzen and others, they talked about, yeah, rivalry with Mother Nature. And like that comes out of envy, which, of course, really womb envy because the earth as mother as like that kind of generative dark space that nurtures, that creates life and continually generating in that cycle of life and death, continually generating life. So they envy that. So they seek immortality. They seek domination. And I really think of like the history of patriarchal religion. If you look at that patriarchal, heavenly, white father God, that whole imagination is of a rival, of envy of the actual creator, who is, of course, what I'm calling the earth mother or mother nature, the force source that is the power of, of the cosmos. I also wanted to come back to this idea that you talk about the thinking of Mother Earth and nature as this kind of like that we, humanity, are the thinkers and the shapers and the doers, the creators of tools, etc. And you write, all Earth beings create, think, make, and shape the world. Yes. 
This is something that thinkers call speciesisms, which is this hierarchy of species that puts, of course, humans, humans, of course, define it and then say, oh, yeah, and humans are the best. And I think it's an arrogant falsity that humans are superior and humans are the only ones animals communicate. There's much and much, there's so much more trees communicate. It, it keeps breaking down as scientists get out of that paradigm and start, oh, that only humans are the ones who can think and create, et cetera. And, and we need to humbly learn from other species. Like maybe humans are really like, you know, as in some indigenous traditions, the younger, youngest species on the planet and really need to learn from the teachers who are the other species who have been here longer and know more how to live in a, in a fruitful and sustaining way. I love that dream that the um, scientist Katie Payne at Cornell University who studied elephants. And she had some kind of capacity that she could hear on a very low frequency. And when she visited elephants in a zoo, she could hear this rumbling. And she realized the elephants were communicating at a frequency deeper than humans, most humans could hear. And in Africa, she worked with elephants and she understood their complex means of communication. And she had a dream where the matriarch, because elephants are in these groups in which the older female is the leader, appeared to her and said, don't think that we told you this because we wanted you to go tell everybody. And at first she said, it sounds like the elephant was saying to her in the dream, don't tell anybody. But then she realized, no, the real point of it is that the elephant is telling me, we told you this. You were not like the heroic explorer, conqueror who got this knowledge by studying your research object elephants. No, actually, you formed a relationship with us and we chose to reveal some knowledge to you. What a different paradigm. So we need to humbly form relationship and ask for knowledge and not think of ourselves as like, you know, it's that whole colonialist explorer motif. It, it really that is, is not a good model for epistemology to go back to your first question. No, it isn't. I just think, you know, growing up in the 70s, 80s, you know, seeing the nature programs, it really seemed to be more about elevating humans than anything else that we're the only ones who use tools, we're the only one with language, just kind of emphasizing the things that elevated us to being a human, whereas animals and all beings, like you said, communicate, use tools, create, like literally every being create and communicate. Right. You know, we've all been told, oh, that was just instinct or something like that. But humans are are thinking, right? And animals are somehow relying on this thing called instinct that means they're dumb, but you know, they've got they're like a machine or something. That's this mechanistic reductive view. And it's not true. And it's again part of that paradigm that humans as the overlords, and humans meaning, of course, Western men, as the overlords of creation, like the God they have made in their image, dominating even unto making the earth instead of the other way around. Yeah. And also, of course, all those images of nature that we see that leave humans out of the picture completely. That's the original conceit that Rachel Carson and um, Aldo Leopold, you know, these environmental philosophers from the 20th century, said was the original fallacy that humans are not part of nature, that we are. We can't dominate nature. We are nature. And so you have to make this original like lie that humans are not part of nature and then create nature as this outside entity to dominate. But, you know, it goes back to religious myth with God throwing Adam and Eve out of the garden and Adam is, and Eve are told to dominate nature and Adam is told to dominate Eve. Okay, we've seen how that script came out. Yeah, yeah. And of course, then you have this notion of women being part of nature, but men not. Yeah, if they tell you that you're closer to nature. And, you know, in a way, it should be a compliment. I'm close to nature. I mean, that means I'm really deeply in tune with the life force and source. But what they meant by it is that humans became human by transcending nature, by going above it, by dominating nature. So if you were closer to nature, you were part of what needed to be dominated. You were less rational. In other words, you weren't white. You weren't a man. <laughs> So you, you would be savage or animalistic or, you know, really literally for like some African peoples displayed in the Bronx Zoo or the Central Park Zoo or kept in the Museum of Natural History, if you were Inuit, in a cage. This is how far they took these understandings and beliefs. And probably like 
We're still doing. I'm saying we here because I might be part of it as a white academic, you know, living a lifestyle in America. But what are we still doing that are replicating these patterns? And how do we, you know, those of us who are, we really have to be attentive and um, refuse to participate as best we can. Yeah, that's easier (laughs) easier said than done. Not to be flippant about it at all, but you feel, I feel extremely trapped at times in, in this machine. Right. You know, we're part of a culture that we know is a very destructive culture. So I guess we have to express disloyalty, disrupt, generate something else as best we can. You talk about rape a lot in your book, which I appreciate because I think so much of this is about rape. But you, and I'm paraphrasing now, you formulate rape as a man who enhances himself by consuming the life force of his victim. But he also simultaneously dumps his toxic yes. waste in her. And you make the comparison with ecological destruction. And you yes. talk about body trauma and land trauma. Yeah. Land trauma is, um, I will get to that. That's not my word. I got that from, um, there's this great, and it's available to everybody online, violence on the land, violence on our bodies, an indigenous understanding of the connection between violation of bodies and destruction against the land. But yes, like in great, and I'm calling upon, I'm going to cite everybody because I'm an academic, but also because it's fair. Nobody thinks of all this stuff on their own. We are in this great involved conversation. Teresa Brennan, a social psychologist, came up with this idea of the transmission of affect in which the powerful person really does kind of energetically consume the life force of those they oppress. And at the same time, relieves himself, because, you know, we're using that idea of Western man, of any kind of negative affects like anxiety or guilt or depression and dumping them into the other. And so I thought that was like really a paradigm for understanding one of the reasons sexual violence is so devastating. But there was a song by Sinead O'Connor, the great Saint Sinead O'Connor. I remember really celebrating when she ripped up that picture of the Pope protesting child sexual abuse endorsed by the church way back in the 90s. She has a song called Take Back What Does Not Belong to Me. This is what she sings. Take back the anger you gave me for me. Take back the hatred you gave me for me. Take back what does not belong to me. And many of us who've been sexually abused, you feel dirty, you feel ashamed, you feel guilty. You are hating yourself. But that's all the affect of the abuser. He's the one who should feel guilty. He's the one who should feel ashamed and feel so-called dirty. And if you look at like, testimony from both abusers as well as people who have been abused. They often talk about feeling like they were used as a receptacle. There's even that horrible slang term, come dumpster. So they extract your energy during the rape, but they dump all their negative affects into you. And then that's part of the trauma that you have to deal with. And that's so similar to something like fracking, where they're taking all these resources out of the earth, like they drill into the earth. I mean, literally, where do these technologies come from? What models are they founded on? With fracking, which sounds a lot like fucking, they actually drill deep into the earth using toxic chemicals to like clear the way, to make it easier to break up the rock and stuff that they're going through. And then they pull out the energy that they want, be it natural gas or oil or whatever, and using it, but then they're leaving behind all this waste. It's so similar. And as that book where I got the idea of land trauma from talks about that so much of fossil fuels are located on indigenous land. And like they bring in all these outside men, set up these man camps. So not only is there this ecological sexualized violence being done to the earth and words like drilling also mean like effing in a very hard, violent way. Like drill is a sign word. All this drilling and violation of land is going on with all these outside men being brought in, as well as like the boom and bust syndrome of energy towns. You get a lot of sexual violence. You get sex trafficking, particularly of young native girls and queer youth. And you get a lot of domestic violence. You get a lot of rape. And this is noticed that wherever there are these extractions of energies in the larger world of rape currents of sexual violence. Yeah. So, so that's connected. A lot, but yeah. And I want to read something to you. There's an article on rape of trans women in prison. This one rapist talks about 
why he does what he does. This is an article by Valerie Jeunesse and Sarah Fenstermaker. Well, it's called 40 Years After Brown Miller, Prisons for Men, Transgender Inmates, and the Rape of the Feminine. And here's a rapist saying, okay, you're locked up. You have no women. You get tired of using your hands, so you dump in them. They are like a dumping ground. You just dump your load in them. And, you know, that language of dumping, and if you think of the earth, I mean, they extract the energies and then they create these dumps, landfills or like mining tailings from mines, et cetera. And that's what they're doing in that just basic paradigm of rape of a body. And it is this energy extraction. They feel rejuvenated. They feel whole. And they have dumped what they perceive of as waste into the feminine, who then have to carry it, who then have to bear it and who are left to suffer the ill effects of that. I think the dumping is as bad as the raping. It's part of it. Yeah, it's part of it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Absolutely part of it. And healing needs to take that into consideration, like a, of a kind of exorcism of all that has been dumped into you that is not yours. It needs to go back. Again, understanding that paradigm of gendered and sexual violence that is at the real core of the kind of ecological destruction that is the Anthropocene, that is the motherfucking, the planned motherfucking in, the, in that very destructive sense of the planet. I think that connection is just as crucial as anything. You write also, a core intent of rape, activist theorists and survivors underscore, is to silence. I remember in the 70s, I was born in 53, just like Breaking the silence, you know, you'd hear that over and over. You'd have these speak outs where um, it was women mostly talking about like what had happened to them and like, you know, everybody saying, name them or tell it. And it's the silencing of your soul, your voice, your emotions, your creativity. You know, it really is meant to shut you down. And so breaking that silence for many survivors has been really crucial. And I think it's also about silencing the earth. I mean, think about it. There's that great book by Carolyn Merchant, The Death of Nature. She wrote it in 1980 and how during the early modern era in what we Western thinkers call the scientific revolution, during the age of enslavement of Africans, genocide of Native Americans, burning of witches, you have this scientific revolution going on, which they decide that the earth is no longer alive. The earth is an object. So that's a profound silencing. You know, there's all this massive rapism going on. And this is when they conceptualize, and this really became part of scientific knowledge, that the earth is really inert, an object, a resource, not a source. And so that's a vast silencing. Again, going back to that book, Violence on the Land, Violence on Our Bodies, many of the thinkers and activists talk about how the earth has a voice, the earth has mothering sounds, and that it is essential to listen to that voice, and to respond, and to form relationship. You talk about this sciencing of nature a lot in this book, and the sort of replacing organic, the understanding of the earth and our environment as organic, replacing it with a mechanistic view. That's Carolyn Merchant's argument, that instead of an organic worldview, an organic doesn't mean just without pesticides. Organic really means like the organs of our body alive, you know, that the earth is alive. And I would add, according to that, also sentient with purposes of their own, that the earth has purposes, knowledge that the earth is alive. And they did end that. And they replaced that with a mechanical worldview in which the earth is like a machine, something that can be broken down into parts, replaced. And then everything becomes sort of reduced, like you are not a whole being. And I see that reflected, and I write about it in the book, in like all the, this like primary icon of our culture, which is like the fembot, the artificial woman, this robotic woman who supposedly represents something of the future and is this projection of, I think, the final capture silencing and complete domination of the force source I'm calling the Earth Mother or Mother Nature. And then you have not only this kind of robotic figure, but you can put your own voice into her. And like all this Alexa and Siri and these female robotic voices bowing to your command, it's, it's creating an idea of the world as your slave, your world as your female slave, and ultimately Earth as your slave. But 
generally, you know, technology has been practiced under the idea if you can do it, you should do it. And you deal with the consequences later from the atom bomb to CRISPR to AI. And that does come out of that mechanistic thinking. And so how do we, you know, this is a question for all of us, but if you take this basic eco-feminist paradigm, you have to have consent. And the consent has to be, you know, just like we talk about consent, vocal, enthusiastic, conscious, you know, not coerced. And you have to have a relationship. So before you start messing with, messing is, of course, also a synonym for effing. Before you eff with nature or mess with nature or rearrange, recognize that you have to establish communication and you have to get consent before you do some of these things that so-called alter nature. And I don't see that. It's still this paradigm that like, only humans are conscious, rational, and have moral significance. You know, maybe whales, maybe chimpanzees have been allowed into that now. But that basically, some humans can mess with other species, including plant species, or with the air, with the water, without having to establish a relationship and get permission. And that, to me, goes back to that motherfucking paradigm. Not practicing restraint not regulating, not stopping yourself, but just going ahead. <laughs> right. No limits, which is the colonialist imperative. Violate that frontier. Just keep going, keep going, keep going. Going where no man has gone before, kind of thing, and not asking permission. Obviously, we know nature has its own intelligence and its own agency and its own decision-making. So here comes humanity making changes in this part of things or in that part of things. Well, nature is going to do still. It's not going to be separate from, you're not going to be able to control because you are just one part of nature's intelligence, one tiny part. And that is so true. Like when we think of climate change, climate change is nature's response to the depredations, to the contamination of the air that some humans have done. It's regulating. It whips up all these more powerful storms because storms dissipate heat, cool off the planet. There always will be a response. And again, unfortunately, the people who are most going to be hurt by that are poor people or marginalized people, people who can't flee the city of New Orleans. But, you know, nature is going to respond and in ways that the humans who think they're controlling nature can neither control nor predict. I did want to get to a very interesting chapter to me about color and aesthetics that you have in your book, which I really, really love. It, oh, thank you. Yeah, it's so unusual to see that kind of, that conversation in this context. But you talk about colorlessness and also color and also artificial color. The Anthropocene, the age of man comes with an aesthetic. And if you can talk a little yeah. bit about all of your thoughts about this. Yes, and I had no idea I was going to write that chapter. I had this dream back in 1999, maybe, that I went to this underground world and there was this bubbling stream of green, sparkling greenness coming up from the ground. And this friend of mine, a native woman from one of the pueblos, I said to her, what does it mean? And she was scattering seed to replant native grasses that birds were all sweeting. And she just looked at me and said, feed the green. And I woke up thinking, whoa, what a meaning greenness is. Like color is not just some arbitrary thing. I mean, greenness is the chlorophyll in plants that makes plants green. That green chlorophyll can come in other colors, but the greenness in plants that really allows life on Earth as we know it, because it allows them to take in carbon dioxide and breathe out oxygen, as well as generate like sugars or carbohydrates so that we can eat plants, all of that. So greenness is really this principle in nature, it's also the color of life, but also the color of death. When we rot, we turn kind of green, right? Or when we're sick. So it really is about this extraordinary life force that is generative, that sustains life, that declines, that dies, that comes back. And it's all really in that color of greenness. And then this friend of mine reminded me of a song by Tom B., who is Dakota and who wrote the song Color Nature Gone. 
He wrote it back in 1973, and he was talking about pollution and devastation brought by some humans on the earth, and he saw it in terms of color. The color blue no longer paints the sky, and the rivers have turned to gray. The color green no longer paints the leaves, and the trees have all burned away. People have made the colors change. Color, nature gone. So if you think about it, color is the active force. Color is the painter. And the painting usually is ongoing, like the colors are continually painting the world. Colorlessness that is replacing it is the aesthetic of the Anthropocene. And it's, it's also like in like a ruined landscape. Think of like the grayness, of concrete and ruined landscapes. But also think of like just sort of that high tech from the film 2001 or these corporate skyscapes of gleaming steel and metal and whiteness and there really is, you know, when I started looking for it, I found extraordinary popular iconography of colorlessness and color, rich, vibrant color is like we've really seen as something for so-called savages. And like, whoa, this really is an aesthetic of that kind of destruction. And then I started thinking about artificial color, which is, of course, mostly associated with plastic. So you have these plastics made originally from coal, but really derived from fossil fuels that are, of course, not recyclable, that are really overwhelming, in that sense, the planet. But think of like the colors of plastic and how they differ from more organic colors and how much we're surrounded by that artificial color. Like the, the men who invented plastic said, this is a simulation of reality, but it's better than reality. And we could live in this plastic world that is actually better than organic nature. And that is manifested in that kind of color. It's all that escape from the dirt, from the earth, and that we're going to create this. I mean, if you listen to some of these guys, Plastic Man, I'm quoting uh, these two chemists who were writing in 1941. Let us try and imagine a new plastic age that Plastic Man will come into a world of color and bright shining surfaces, a world free from moth and rust and full of culture, a world in which man, like a magician, makes what he wants for almost every need out of what is beneath him and all around him. We'll see a new, brighter, cleaner, and more beautiful world, the perfect expression of the new spirit of planned scientific control, the plastic age. So we don't have to have that natural process of rust or decay. We will live in this permanent, completely phallic world of complete artifice because it'll never rot, it'll never decay. And then the imagination for these types is that they too will become immortal, that they will never have to change or decay. This is, again, that rivalry of Mother Nature, whose essence is change. So, and it's, of course, absolute folly. Yeah, you, you talk about that. It's about holding humanity above dirt, in a sense. It is. But it makes me think of the move towards artificial wombs, the medicalization of birth. And, and I feel like a lot of that holding yourself above dirt is holding man above woman. You talk about that life is made in the dark, and it really is mm -hmm. made in the dark. It's inside where men can't see. <laughs> and that yeah. makes them intensely uncomfortable, I think. I mean, the dark is what allows us to dream, you know, the seed to grow, the fetus to generate in the womb. Darkness is wonderful. Darkness really is a force. And of course, light pollution is trying to get rid of all the darkness that would nurture that kind of imagination and growth. I think some of misogyny is in that. Absolutely. Like, women are told all the time that we're dirty. I mean, our genitals are dirty. Or like the ideal of like white womanhood is clean and pure. That image of cleanness, which is, of course, ethnic cleansing. Cleanness has so often been used as a way of like euphemizing atrocity or some kind of destruction of anybody and anything associated with the organic, with the feminine, with the dark. But color points us to, you know, not only all the colors of the earth, but the rainbow. In many world traditions, the rainbow is the symbol of another way of being. The rainbow either as part of like a deity, as in many African traditions, where the deity is understood as all of these kinds of colors, that extraordinary color that comes is this bridge into another world as well. Like, you know, how the rainbow looks like a bridge. And it's always understood as this transformative 
you know, the, the possibility of the world really changing for the better is always there. So just one last, you talk about conctipotence. Am oh, yeah. I, am I getting it? Conctipotence is how I say it. Okay, great. <laughs> Can you explain what that is? Yes. I first came across this concept in Barbara Walker's, the Encyclopedia of Women's Myths and Secrets, Barbara Walker. And she does something on the word cunt. And she relates the word conctipotence to cunt, says that it derived from that. And conctipotence is a, a Latin word that means all powerful. And I contrast it to the word omnipotence, meaning all powerful, but potency, you know, impotent potency. Potency has become so identified with a man's ability to get an erection. So omnipotence is like, again, that patriarchal God who is really a phallus, who is permanently hard and dominating and all of that. But we need another understanding of all powerful. And I see that as conctipotence. Linguists say that it doesn't really come from cunt. It comes from cunctus, which is a Latin word meaning all. But so what? It's a good folk etymology, as we, again, but it's a different model. It's a non-phallic model of power in which contipotence is the power of the all in connection with the all. It is like that extraordinary spiritual force that when we feel absolutely connected to everything that is. It's like in The Color Purple when Shug tells Seeley, I knew if I cut a tree my arm would bleed. It's when Virginia Woolf looks at a flower in the dirt and realizes that the flower and the dirt are inseparable. Or Amber Tam Canty, who is a farmer, was recovering the Black tradition of farming, and her father killed her mother, and she became almost speechless. But when she says when she laid her mother's body in the ground, she knew that this meant the earth was her mother. And I think I, that's kind of what I was thinking of when I said before that the earth mother connected us to this continuum and ancestry and also future. When you really do connect that way, you understand the complete continuity of being that you are a part of. And that is the essence of contipotence, which is the power of the all, power that allows us to act to change the world for the better. That's wonderful. Thank you for that explanation. That it's was a great cool. word, isn't it? Contipotence. Love that word. <laughs> I do too. It rolls off the tongue. <laughs> yeah. Well, thank you so very much for this interview. And thank you course, so much, Elle. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Jim. Bye-bye. Thank you for listening to Subject to Power. You can find the show online at subjecttopower.com or subscribe to the show wherever you find your podcasts. I'd love to know your thoughts on these conversations, so please drop a note on the website or find us on social media. The best way to support the show is to rate and review Subject to Power on Apple Podcasts. It really helps other listeners find us. Subject to Power is written, hosted, and produced by me, El Kamihira. Audio engineering is done by Jason Sheasley at Abridged Audio. Cover art by B. Johnson. And music by Beware of Darkness. <laughs>